This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. My guest today found herself a single mom when her husband left her after many years of marriage. Peggy Sue Wells went on to raise her family and began writing books to encourage other single moms. She shares her story with me today. It, when you look at uh, the, the, I guess the reaction or the, the response of, of the church, now, is it still that same way today or does is this, is this go back to where uh, a divorced person can't serve in the church? Do they, they feel like you're carrying in, I mean, you are carrying in some baggage, but they feel like you're carrying in extra baggage that's going to infect the rest of the congregation or the rest yeah. of the kids in Sunday school? Yeah, I think a lot of it has just been they just wanted to not endorse divorce in any yeah. way, shape, or form. And it's been difficult with the church situation because when I was in the church, if my children were in a not good situation, if they're in an unsafe situation, then I'm a bad mom. If I can't make my marriage work, then I'm a bad wife. And so, like, either way, mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm going to lose in this one. And that's kind of how it's been viewed. And I, before my situation, I can remember looking at people thinking, if you would just read the Bible and do what it says, if you just had enough faith, it would all be yeah. okay. Until I went through it. And it's like, oh, it's not that easy. It doesn't go that smoothly. It's not if you just work hard enough, if you do, you know, if you check off the check right. boxes. You're dealing with humans and people make choices sure. and some of them have a Grand Canyon size impact on those around them. And we do all come in with our different baggage and whatnot, but the church itself, they have been reluctant to let somebody who is divorced be involved in anything sort of teaching or mm -hmm. children, whatever ministries, praise, you know, praise team, whatever. But this is changing and this book, the 10 best decisions a single mom can make is proof of it because when Pam and I and our agents got on the phone with our publisher to just talk about the concept mm -hmm. of all the five, six, seven people on that call, almost every one of us had experienced a, a, a single mom situation. We either Some were single moms yeah. or they were the kids of single moms. And so these kids now have grown up, they're in the church, they're in Christian publishing, and they're saying, we need to address mm -hmm. this. And so we need to come alongside and we need to be the church to support everyone. And when you have somebody that walks in with all their baggage, all we're doing is proving, oh yeah, I need a I savior. Need, yeah. Just like everybody well, else, I need a savior. That's, that's one of the decisions you, you talk about in here, is decide to live in community. Mm -hmm. you, do you keep knocking on doors until you find the one that says, come on in, we want to embrace this? Please do. If you are attending a church that is not supportive and not, you know, if they just, if you walk out feeling worse mm -hmm. than when you walked in, that's probably not your church home at this moment. And so then go find one where the people are like, we love you. We're going to one another, one another's. And um, God tells us how to love one another. They will know that you are mine by your love. And he said, you don't need to judge. He's not asking us to judge. He is asking us to come alongside and to love one another. And we all make mistakes. And so whether the divorce was a mistake, whether it was a bad choice, that's still something that, like every other sin, we need to work through that and get to the other side so that we are still in relationship with community and with the Lord. And when our kids are in a situation with the church, they can hear more about Jesus and they can see healthy families and they can have people come alongside them and help them to understand what a healthy relationship looks like. So then when they get grown up, they're going to make a better choice in their own relationships. So the church has, has so much to offer that, yes. that if they don't step into that, the, the kids suffer, the, the single mom suffers. It's, yes. you, you just lose that connection with Christ. Yeah, and we actually are your easiest mission field because we're right in your neighborhood. Yeah. So just go out and just you know invite people in your neighborhood to come in. One in four homes, that'll be a single parent home. Bring them in. And then if the church has excellent child care, and one of the best things that I've seen is when the grandparents are in there doing the Sunday schools and the nursery and all that because we're done raising our kids. We're not exhausted. We're not sleep deprived. And that gives those young parents that are sleep deprived and working a job and parenting, give them an hour to just sit and be fed. Yeah. And that single mom who's running on fumes, let her sit there for an hour and yeah. let her be fed spiritually, emotionally, physically. Don't ask her to jump in. Yeah, she's like exhausted. Yeah. Let her go sit, feed her spirit. 
And then, so if you have also, when there's a regular face, so if you have the same grandparents that are there that are, that are um, taking care of the children, the kids walk in like, oh, I know you. And so there's that feeling of familiarity and being comfortable. And when the single mom comes in, don't relegate her to the single class. Mm -hmm. Some well, of us just don't want to be that, there. That happens, yeah, yeah. Well, that happens a lot. Well, we can match some people up, maybe possibly. Yeah. Find, find a mate, and it would be okay then. Yeah, then you would be like okay, or then you would be whole. Yeah. And that's not everybody's calling. God isn't calling all of us to marry. God's not calling all of us to marry while we still have children. Some of us, because parenting is a season, and when our kids are grown, a lot of people then find a relationship. But to bring another spouse in, to bring another marriage in to children that are traumatized already, and then you have to blend mm -hmm. different ways of parenting and different backgrounds and different beliefs and different families, you gotta really pray about that and make sure that that's the direction that God wants you to do. And there's great stepdads, including Joseph mm -hmm. of the New Testament. He was an awesome stepdad. There are good ones, but I would just really recommend let the moms be guided by the Lord as to whether they're supposed to enter into another relationship or not. I tell the moms, make sure your kids' tanks are full first mm -hmm. because you're their only mom. Anybody can date. And be very careful about who you bring into your home. It's very, very vital for the children. Sure. And they're already stirred up. So let's give them, again, a foundation and consistency. Yeah, yeah I can't imagine what that's like if... if the dating goes into some serious relationship and you're blending two families with two sets of kids. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the trauma and the, and, and the confusion can even get, could even get worse. But it, it, does, and it, it happens does. And, it, and it's successful at times. Yep, I, I know a couple that, that, that have done it very successfully, yeah. but yeah. Uh, it's, it's, not the, it's not the norm sometimes. It's not the norm and the stats aren't in your favor. So that's why I always tell people, first off, one is a whole number. <laughs> one is okay, because mm -hmm. when, when we're thrown right into a Sunday school class for just singles, then it's almost like the message there is, well, if you were in a relationship, then you'd be okay. Mm -hmm. But since you're not, yeah. we have to like put you in this special place. Whereas actually one is a whole number. And if I get healthy as a one, then when a relationship does come together, we'll be there because we want to be with one another and because we're good with one another, not because I need this person and they need me and then we're trying to have them be our savior when actually that role's already been filled. Oh, filled by Christ. Yes. Something that, uh, that uh, you know, when the, when the Lord hits you with something and says, pay attention to this, he did that for me in this book. Really? Tell <laughs> yeah. me. Yeah. Well, I, I, it's, it's embarrassing, kind of, in a way. The root of conflict, it's in decide to be a proactive parent. Mm -hmm. And the root of conflict, and you've got the five R's there. Yes. And uh, I, I see myself going through that at times. And with my children, with my wife, with uh, yeah. even with my mother at times, I find oh. myself going oh, through yeah. that. <laughs> and uh, lay that out for us because it, 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 it hit me, and I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to ring true to the audience as well. I have not talked to anybody who didn't go, oh, yeah. I so do that. And the way that the five R's, so... I started noticing as we would get together for gatherings with my family, mm -hmm. we would sort of emotionally abuse one another and then have pie. And I'm like... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I read that line. I, right? I, I thought, yeah, that's happened with us. Exactly. Yeah. And I didn't want to repeat that in my household mm -hmm. because I kind of grew up with that. And I'm like, you know, so, so I go to the Bible and of course it says, as far as possible, live at peace with one another. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as it depends on you. And so I'm like, hey, God... I'm doing my part. It is clearly all those others, so you need yep. to get to work with them. And he said, um, we, we need to have a conversation. He said, um, the one common denominator in all your relationships is you. So I said, okay, show me what I'm missing. And that's what he showed me, the five R's. And so the way that the five R's work um, is, is probably best pictured. There was one Saturday morning, my teenage daughter is grousing around the house. And so I made her pancakes and I told jokes and I made her tea and she didn't drink my tea and she didn't laugh at my jokes and she just pushed that pancake around on her plate. And so I'm like, you know, I'm doing the mom mode thing. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to like, you know, make you feel better. And everything that I've done is not getting received. So I'm feeling rejected. And so that's the first R, mm -hmm. rejection. We feel rejected because something is said, done, not said, not done. But I feel rejected. You take it personally and, and totally I'm personally. focused on me. Oh, yeah. And so then um, we're sitting at the table and I'm feeling now resentful that I'm feeling rejected because I don't like this feeling. This is not good. Mm -hmm. 
Then I moved, so it's, re, it's um, rejection and then resentment. Then we moved into resistance. So she's sitting there quietly and I'm like, okay, fine. You're not gonna talk to me. I'm not gonna talk to you. You're not gonna look at me. I'm not gonna look at you. Like that is like reeking of any sort of maturity on the planet. But if you've ever given or received the silent treatment, that's R yes. for resistance. Yeah. We've all done it. Uh -huh. The <laughs> next step is revenge. Guilty. The next step is revenge and that's where my heart is hurting, and so I want you to know that how it feels. And so the way that I can do that is I'll set up a situation where your heart will hurt, and then you'll go, oh, that's how you feel. It's not logical, but it's what mm -hmm. we do. And so I was just about to say, hey, when are you gonna clean your room? Hey, are you keeping those grades up above sea level? You know, we really need you to watch that homework. I was just about to do that, and as I'm opening my mouth, I'm like, oh, I'm in the five R's. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what happens is I would say something like that. And if I did, what is she going to do? She's going to be like, whoa, mom's throwing stilettos with her words. Mm -hmm. I'm going to back out of this. And so she would mm -hmm. move back for protection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mom's on the warpath. And then I would feel her move back. So then I would feel rejected again. And so then we go into repeat. So and so we go into the cycle and we do this over and over again. And if you're in a family, if you're in a work setting, if you're in a church where you're with people all the time, we repeat this until sometimes we kill a relationship and it's not fixable. Mm -hmm. So what I did in this particular situation this Saturday, when I got to the R for revenge, I went, oh, so I said, Hannah, the story I'm making up in my head right now is that you would rather be anywhere else on Saturday morning than here with me stuck home because I stink as a mom. And that was the story I made yeah. up in my head. But you were, and, and you were, at that time, you're, you're focused on, it must be me. It has to be. It must be me and I feel rejected. Yeah. And uh, it must be something I did or said or. And all the stories that we make up in that first hour of rejection and then going into resentment, mm -hmm. every, every story we make up, and we're all fiction writers, good fiction writers in our head, that story is always negative towards me and it always becomes my reality. And so then I react to you, I treat you based on this story in my head, which has nothing to do with reality. So as I said to Hannah, here's the story I'm making up in my head. She kind of like blinks and looks up and she says, mom, I just found out the boy I babysit for has leukemia. Mm. It had nothing, nothing to do good. with me. I, I noticed that where you said note to self, most folks not even thinking no. about me. <laughs> There's other things going on in their life because people do what they do for their own reasons, and it rarely has anything to do with us. After the break. If you hear that coming out of my mouth, I'm in resentment. And so then it's like, oh, I hear it in my vocabulary. I need to change my vocabulary to, I'm glad that, I'm happy that. And so I go back to the positive instead of the negative. So that gets us out of resentment. That's coming up next on Viewpoint. Get involved, then donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. Point with Bob Lacey is now available as a podcast. Download your favorite podcast app like iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify and search for Viewpoint with Bob Lacey. Subscribe and listen as we discuss these important topics each week. My guest, Peggy Sue Wells, shares with us that keeping the focus on Christ is the key to how she raised her children after her husband left the family. You're doing your best to live the life that you have. There's a lot of pressures, a lot of challenges. We're all doing our best. And so it's generally not about me. Now, those people that have been in my situation where there has been a divorce, there's some people that sometimes on purpose do things to hurt you. Sure. 
on purpose. So what do you do with that? And so I've had to go back to the first R, which is with, for when we're feeling rejected, to stop the whole parade of going through the five R's. And in the book, I explain what to do when you, when you find yourself in any one of the R's, how to reverse that and put your relationships back on good footing. But the very beginning is rejection. And the way to um, not go into the five R's is to stick to the facts. So what are the facts? And the facts are my daughter was grousing around the house that morning. If I'd have left it, you know, the teens got a mood this morning. If I'd have left that, we would have no drama, no problem whatsoever. That would have been the fact. And the same thing when you have someone who is purposely coming at me. I have to say, you know what? That's just them being them again. You know, the fact is, that's just them being them. And then move forward without going into the five R's. And we had this happen not too long ago when the baby got married last year. Because once you're the baby, you're always the baby. You're always ba yeah, baby girl. Baby girl. Right. And so she got married. I mean, if you want to have drama, have a wedding. Oh. And so we've had a lot of them. And where I have yeah. six very opinionated, strong women that are my daughters. And so and as we're... And one boy. And one boy. We may talk about that here in a yeah. minute. <laughs> so as we're putting that all together... We're having the, the, the um, sister that was doing the shower says to me, Mom, is your friend coming because I'm putting the seating chart together? And I'm like, yeah, good question. I don't know. I sent her an invitation. I called her twice. I haven't heard back. I have no idea if she's coming or not. And so my kids know about the five R's. And so my daughter goes, so, Mom, what's the facts? I'm like, <laughs> oh, the facts. Well, the facts are... I sent her an invitation, I called twice, I haven't heard back, I'll call again. Mm. It changes everything if I just go to the facts and get that story out of my head, and then we don't do the drama. Yeah. So those are the five R's. Uh, how do you get out of that if you're, if you're in a situation with, say, a, a, a spouse that uh, you, you know you're not getting along, there's, there's, mm -hmm. there's problems, there's issues there. How do you get yourself out of that if, if uh, they continue to try to push your buttons? Yeah. Um, it happens a lot with spouses because spouses know each other the mm -hmm. best and they know and they the know, buttons. They know what's, yeah. And so whether the, what, again, can't control the other person, whatever they do, that's on them. But for us, I need to stick to the facts. Mm -hmm. And then that's the first, for the first part of the rejection. Going into resentment, it's recognizing when I'm in it, and you can hear it. It comes out my mouth because I'm like, well, he should, and they need to, uh, and I'm not perfect, but if you hear that coming out of my mouth, I'm in resentment. And so then it's like, oh, I hear it in my vocabulary. I need to change my vocabulary to I'm glad that, I'm happy that, and so I go back to the positive instead of the negative. So that gets us out of resentment. Resistance is I'm not engaging. And so to break that, I need to engage. I need to like say to Hannah, the story I'm making up in my head right now is, and then we can be, you know, we need to re-engage. Then with the um, revenge, that is a, it's a stripping of life from the other person in some way. And so what I have to do instead is to give, to be generous. And so even when you don't want to be generous to this person because you're in this mood with them, I'd be generous to them. And Jesus tells us that. And when I am generous to them, it changes and flips all of that. And if it's a person that is not healthy to be generous yeah, with. where they're going to continue to take and take and yeah, take and expect more. Or they're, it's somebody that it's not even healthy for you to be around. Yeah. In that case, find someone to be generous to, not the unsafe person, but be generous. Mm -hmm. You've got to give to get out of that. And then for the repeat, it's to stop having expectations on someone. To stop expecting that, well, when I go to family you know, vacation, when I go to family holidays, this person's going to act like that, and this person's going to be this, and I expect them to treat me like this, and I expect so-and-so to say this. It's like, no, no expectations the same way I don't want expectations on me. Release them from expectations, and then we can stay out of the five R's. Yeah. I don't want to say that you're a special case or you're unusual, but you, you love to write. Mm -hmm. You got into this situation. Uh, the husband left. And you had the, the kind of the, the uh, genesis of a career in writing. And how do you uh, say, I'm going to put all my energy into that? How do you not do that when you've got seven kids and you say, well, I've got to make this life of my own. I'm going to put all my energy into becoming the, the mompreneur that you talked about mm -hmm. in here. The, I, I've got this business and I'm going to put all my energy into that. How do you, how do you guard against that when you've still got more than enough energy to spend on these children. I mean, it's going to suck all the energy yeah. you have, yeah. but you also want, an, you want a career. 
How do you yeah. balance that? That's the hardest thing for, for solo moms. That is mm -hmm. the, you just laid it out. That is the toughest decision because we do have to keep food on the table. Sure. And it's tough to decide where I'm going to do that and where is the best way to do it. And it's also rugged to have a limited amount of energy. And so when, you know, you come home from work, everybody's exhausted. Yeah. And, and you've got kids that are... We got homework and sure. we got, you know, school things that we have to do and you got to cook and you got to do laundry and you make sure everybody's good. And so that's one of the things that the church can also do is sometimes be the place where the kids can go after school and do their homework in a safe setting. Mm -hmm. uh, it can also be the place where an other, you know, people in the church come alongside and they're like, what do you need help with? Well, in my case, math. Calculus. <laughs> Yes. I'm like, when the first time somebody said their kid had calculus, I'm like, I am so sorry. Is that a skin disease? Have you seen the doctor? And so I don't do math. And so you ask why I write. It's because I, I don't do math. But it took a really long time to get out of trauma brain and to figure out where I'm supposed to go. And I really recommend that get with mentors in your church, get with a counselor if you can, because it's so hard to make those decisions when we have all this stuff coming at us and our brain is not in the right place. And I tried a whole lot of things, a whole lot of things to figure out what to do to do that was going to be the best to take care yeah. of my family. It's hard. To it would. Uh, That's it sounds hard impossible one. to me. You're spending all this energy on the children and you, especially in a successful career, yeah. where you see, you see fruit in that career and think, if I do a little more, if I add a little more time, <laughs> yeah. if I write a little bit more, it's going to be even more fruitful. We and, hope. <laughs> yeah, well, I, which yeah. it should be. Yeah. And you get to that place where you're like so brain dead that nothing that yeah. we're doing is of any use either. I did understand, too, that there are five different or four different types of rest. And God tells mm -hmm. us on Sabbath. And so you have to take one day a week where he says, do that which refreshes your soul. What is it that refreshes our soul? And my children needed that, and I needed that. And we needed times to just say, we have to just stop, because if we keep yeah. spinning, we run out. Yeah. And that's something, too, that the church can be super, super helpful of, is to understand that these moms are exhausted. And when, when a husband dies, women end up sometimes even like turning away all the casseroles that are coming. When a husband goes off to the military, People come and they help with car maintenance and they help with your yard work oh, and yard, things that yeah. break down in your house. When there's a divorce, the church stops talking to the moms and the children. And that's kind of been the pattern in the past. And so if we can not do that, if we can step forward and say, let me be your friend, let me walk with you through this. And then every other weekend when that mom's kids are somewhere, she's a worker bee. Mm -hmm. She'll come into the church and get all your programs running and going great. Pam said her best church support were the single moms oh, wow. every other weekend because they wanted something really constructive to do. So again, for the church to come alongside and say, yeah, we get it. You're human like us. We understand you're super smart in some areas. We also understand you need some help with this. And let me watch your kids while you get your hair done and while you go to the dentist. Mm -hmm. That would be really helpful. Yeah. One last thing, and I, I want to just get into this a little bit, is that you, six daughters, mm -hmm. one son in the middle. My middle child. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, I was a middle child, and I know how he feels. But uh, I've raised a son, I've raised a daughter, my wife and I have. And daughters are tougher, I think. <laughs> I don't know why, but daughters can be tougher. But how do you how do you not fall into the trap of I, I've I've got to raise this son, and I, I'm not the father, I'm not the male figure. How do you stay out of the trap of trying to be or bringing somebody in that uh, mm. uh, that's going to take over and become that that father figure for that son when that can be dangerous as well? Right. Because uh, your son is very successful. He is. And thankfully, thank God, all my children have a relationship with the Lord and all my children are doing well. They are contributing, functioning parts of society, which is my greatest <laughs> gift from the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have kept them close to you. And um, here's the thing. When something is missing, when a part is missing, it's not our responsibility to fill it. To be that part. It's not always our responsibility to even find something to be that part. There are times where... In our lives, the way God crafted my life and your life, there are parts that you don't have. There's parts that are missing. But it is the situation that he put us in because it's the situation that he's going to use to teach me about him and about his character. And so it's not always about fixing every hole. 
It's about we have this hole, and sometimes you have this big hole in your heart, and time doesn't heal our wounds, but sometimes it teaches us to live with that hole, that gaping hole in our heart. And so wherever our empty places are, that's why we want Jesus to come in and fill those things. But yeah, that whole idea of running out and trying to you know, fill all the holes, we can't, and we're not asked to. Trust the Lord in that. And then with my son, what I did do was I looked for his interests, but I looked for interests of all my kids. Like, mm -hmm. what are your interests? And so I've got, you know, ones that do this and ones that do that. And we just would be, when they would say, can I do this? Or I want to do that. Or can we get one of these? And I would say, well, how can we make that happen? Yeah. Because my first thought is, are you kidding? No, absolutely yeah, no. You can't but do everything. Can't yeah, buy can't, everything. can't do everything. Yeah. Sure, don't have the time. Don't have the money. Like, no. But I would just say, well, how can we make this happen? And I cannot tell you how creative my kids got and the different things that they've been able to participate in because we're like, can we make it happen? And sometimes they would come back and go, yeah, that's not going to work, but they had tried, you know? And other times it was like, wow, we like totally are doing this. So like I have one daughter who barrel races. All my children play several instruments of music. And then my son wanted to fly. He would just watch those military planes go over our house. And so I said, you want to fly? He's like, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, how can we make that happen? Mm -hmm. So we found the Civil Air Patrol, yeah. and he went right in. And there wasn't anybody that was stepping in to be a father, but there was good men, good male role models that taught him things that he wanted to learn to do. He learned how to fly. He learned how to do a bunch of stuff, and he loved it. And so by just, you know, delight directed, where do you want to go? And then in those situations, people come around my kids and there will be different individuals at different times that would just, just connect with one. One of my daughters is a painter. And so I had an artist that came alongside her. She was old enough to be her grandmother and taught her to paint, taught her to do portraits. And so it's like, thank you for being that person for her. And then, like I said, there have been people that have come alongside each of my children and helped them bloom. And I'm grateful. Good job. <laughs> just amazed. But the book is the 10 best decisions yeah. a single mom can make and to get in touch with you or to buy the book. Yeah, um, because I didn't want people to just be left with just the book, there is singlemomcircle.com. So if you go on the website to singlemomcircle.com, mm -hmm. you can self-identify if you're looking for finances, faith, fitness, family, whatever. And there's all kinds of free resources on there for the moms and they can you know, just okay. grab what they want. And then um, go to PeggySueWells.com and you can find me and um, if you've got questions, send them my way. And the best thing that we can do for our moms is get those books and put them in our church libraries. And then if you know a single mom, give her the book. She can't afford it generally, but she needs it. And then your church can do an amazing Bible study. It would just be, you know, sure. a chapter each week, Solid. go over the questions and yeah, talk with these moms. It's our hope that Viewpoint encourages you to have the faith and knowledge to live an authentic life for Christ. As we do each week, I remind you that this show and the ministries of TV44 are supported by viewers just like you. So we'd appreciate your financial support. I'm Bob Placey. Thanks for joining me. For more interviews on demand, plus additional resources from today's guests, go to WTLW.com and click on the Viewpoint tab.